Um, I guess we'll get started. So welcome everyone also from, from my side. Um, I will just give a, a little bit of an overview of the plan for this session. So we have 90 minutes. Um, and we just have a few introduction slides that we will go through, like uh, just giving a little bit of the background. Uh, we'll just show how to uh, set up the workshop in the cloud uh, on Orchestra. There is also the link already in the chat. Um, then we will give an introduction to the GUI, so what the, the application, the IC applications look like. And the rest of the time will be basically interactive exercises where we really hope that everyone will uh, participate and uh, learn how to use uh, IC uh, uh, efficiently. So if you want to interact with us now or later, I mean, now we can do it here in the, in the platform, but um, we also have an IC uh, channel in the Slack workspace. Uh, there's a link here to the slides. It's also in the sh in the chat. Uh, there is a link to the to the vignette that we will um, uh, go through later, uh, and we also have a GitHub organization where uh, we kind of have all the things related to uh, to IC. So as you already seen, we are uh, three of the four original developers are here. Uh, this is a uh, pictures of our younger selves. Um, <laughs> So, a couple of extra very blonde ones on the on yeah. there. <laughs> so uh, Kevin, Federico, and myself are, are here. And, and the fourth uh, developer is, is Aaron Loon. Um, so uh, if you attended Kevin's session on Biasy Challenges on Monday, you already have heard the story about how this whole thing started at the uh, Eurobiasy uh, three years ago. Right, so I see uh, is really designed, it's in Bioconductor, it's also designed really for Bioconductor, uh, and you will see shortly exactly what we mean by that. So you can already hear from the name, right? The, the IC stands for the Interactive Summarized Experiment Explorer, which kind of says already what it's doing. It's a, an interactive uh, exploratory tool for summarized experiment uh, objects. Uh, and it works on summarized experiment objects, but also on any kind of objects that kind of extend or uh, inherit from the summarized experiment, like the single cell experiment, for example. So that's what we're gonna use actually for the exercises uh, today. But it would also work for a DSEQ data set or a tree summarized experiment, for example, that, uh, that's all inherit from the, the summarized experiment in one way or another. So the single cell experiment or the summarized experiment are really uh, made to hold any kind of rectangular data. So any data you can put in a matrix, uh, for example, a gene expression uh, uh, data set, a gene expression matrix that you will put in one of the assays. Uh, you can have multiple assays if you have different types of normalized data, for example. Uh, then you have a row data uh, slot that contains annotations for the rows, so for the genes, uh, for example, if this is a gene expression data set. You will have a, um, a call data slot, which contains the annotations for the columns, so for the samples or the cells. And then for the single cell experiment, you will also have a reduced dimension slot where you can include uh, PCA results or uh, TSNI coordinates or UMAP coordinates so that you don't have to recalculate these ones uh, all the time. And you can also have multiple of those. So this is a very general uh, data container. Right? We're, we're going to look at single cell data, single cell RNA-seq data today, but it really works for any type of uh, data that you can put in a, this type of rectangular format. So one thing that's really nice about Bioconductor is, is this um, uh, interoperability between the, uh, the different packages. So there are many, many packages in the single cell um, world in Bioconductor that cannot uh, take single cell experiment object as input and also uh, give single cell experiment output as uh, object as output. Um, so this just some of them, you can import data from quantification pipelines directly into this type of objects to quality control, normalization, dimensionality reduction, clustering, marker gene detection, trajectory inference, all in this kind of single cell experiment object uh, world. And in the end, you can, or throughout the process, really, you can do uh, visualization with IC. So just to uh, make this point a little bit, uh, 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 one more time, uh, the IC really um, integrates really with, with the single cell experiment or the summarized experiment objects. It's going to take um, the different uh, uh, slots or the different uh, parts of the single cell experiment object 
um, extract them and visualize them in different ways. And we will see a lot of examples of this uh, in this workshop. So before we go to the practical part, we just wanted to give just one very um, quick overview of what an IC app could look like. So this is um, what you would see if you loaded uh, this particular data set here. This is a single cell RNA-seq data set. You, can, you have these different panels. Uh, we will see shortly exactly which panels are available and what you can do with them. Um, and they basically let you explore your data set from many different uh, angles at the same time and an, in an interactive uh, fashion. So uh, with that, we are going to go to the actual workshop. So what you kind of uh, have to do now, or what we really encourage you to do now is to follow along. That's going to make it much more fun for, for you. Um, and it's really the by far easiest to, to run this workshop in the, in the orchestra on the cloud. Um, and the, the main reason is that the data set we're going to use is already included in the container. So you don't have to generate this uh, manually if you if you uh, run it on, on the cloud. So um, what I suggest that, that you do is that you go to, to this uh, page, you log in, and it again saved my password. So if you haven't saved the password in the browser, and I thought I had removed it, so you will get a, a login page where you can either register if you haven't registered before, or log in with a either the Google um, account or with the uh, email address and password that you registered with. And what you then should do is to search for IC and make sure to choose the right one. And it's this one, the one with the shorter name and the fewer la launches. So this one here, IC Interactive Summarist Experiment Explorer. Uh, you click Launch. And then you will wait here until uh, it gives you a little button that says launch. And then you remember that you sh the username and the password here uh, are, are studio in order to launch uh, the workshop. And then you, you launch the workshop and you sign into Art Studio. So these first two here. And uh, then I suggest that in a separate tab, you open the package down website. So this is this website here, which contains all the information and all the material that we will uh, walk through now. So this is just a readme and all the individual vignettes uh, are available here under articles for you. I think I will hand over to Federico. Okay, so now I just posted in the feed, in the chat feed, the link to the vignette, but I just gonna find it for you or with you again. So we just have to go into articles and then overview of the IC package. And be careful of not clicking on the snow because that probably will invalidate the click. But anyway, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview. There's no need of kind of overloading with too much information of what everything that I see can do. We realize basically that for such an online workshop, it's probably easier of to to give the workshop in such a way that we try to give it as a recipe like cookbook. So sometimes you just need a few fun functionality pieces and you don't need to go too much into depth. So the thing is that recipe number one, if we want to call it like that, or re recipe number zero, is that using IC should be as easy as saying IC of that summarized experiment object. And the thing is that it does. So if we just take this first command and try to copy that into the into your console, this will load, for example, the demo SCE data set. You can specify PBMC3K. OK, so this is your single cell experiment. So these are about 3,000 of cells of, of, of PBMC cells, for which we already computed some reduced dimensions and also some kind of labels that you can use, for example, as a call data object. So we already assigned the cell, the cell types according to the matching on the Monaco data sets that is available uh, when you run single R on that. And yeah, pretty much it. So if you want to just run IC on that, you just say IC of this SCE object, and it should open up the app in a pretty much default configuration. Probably this is now a little too small, and I will just probably enlarge it a little to see to, to display how it can look like. So when I see starts, it starts with a pre-configured set of, pack of, of panels. And I will, drive, I will guide you through all of them right now. So let's just keep the app running if you want. But then in the end, 
we just go through this uh, vignette. And for example, what you can also do importantly is that you can also run IC as a hub-like resource so that you can just say IC and then open close the parentheses and you will be able to, to upload your summarize experiment object as an RDS file so that the app just basically gets re-updated re automatically and it will uh, pretty much open up any data set that you can upload. The main limitation would be the size. So if you are running that on a server or locally, you might need to tweak the, the functionality to decide how large the maximum data set should be. But apart from that, it's it just works like that. So in IC, you have, as you have seen, a couple of built-in panel types. And these actually try to cover most of the operation that you can or want to do with your data set. You can see that they are structured in a pretty much in a hierarchical way. And the reason for that is that you we, we wanted to actually exploit the fact that the inheritance brings in a clever hierarchy of panels so that we do not have to redefine them from the scratch anytime. So you have dot plots that can be column dot plot or row dot plots. We have tables and we have something that brings together rows and columns at the same time, which is a heat map plot. So in this case, a complex heat map plot. Just going one by one, a reduced dimension plot is, for example, where you might want to uh, inspect your TSNI plot or your UMAP plot. So this is quite a kind of a must uh, must be shown or must be happening figure in your in your manuscript if you are working with single cell data. Then you have a column data plot, and the column data plot basically handles whatever is a cell level feature. And that can be plotted by, for example, by any experimental covariate of your, of your samples or any other uh, continuous covariate that you want. I see is actually clever enough to understand whether how, how to handle this. So if it's a categorical variable on the x axis and a continuous one on the y axis, it will display your data as a violin plot so that you can see all the single data points. If it's a categorical, if it's a continuous versus continuous one, like in this case for a row data plot where you have a gene level feature on the y axis, it will be displayed as a simple scatter plot. Then for the heat map, I don't think there's too much to say about it. So, but in the end, you select an, a, a subset of cells out of these. You can also annotate that with some kind of decoration based on the column data. And you can also display the expression level of your features, in this case, genes. In many cases, it's going to be genes, but it could be something else. As Charlotte already said, uh, anything rectangular like can be fed into IC because anything can be fed into a summarized experiment like class. So we move on to the feature essay plot, which can also be a very good uh, archetype of plot to inspect the gene expression level versus any other covariates, for example, the cluster or let's say the cell type, if the cell type is not just exactly redundant with your clusters, which can be just attributed in a, in a pretty much uh, arbitrary way. Then you also have sample essay plots, which basically plot any sample level quantity. So the um, low counts, so the, uh, the, this is for example, the total amount of observed values for the two samples in this case, and then we have tables. Tables are extremely useful for doing one thing in a, say, beginner to medium level of usage of IC. That would be the linking of the panels. Otherwise, it's a simply interactive and browsable uh, level information for your row data or for your column data. So whatever is a feature level uh, feature or, a, say, sample level feature, in this case, the cells. Then below every of these panels, you have different controls. The three main ones can be called the data parameters. Then you have the visual parameters, and then you have the selection parameters. The data parameters display are actually the ones that control what you display. So what you should display on the Y axis, whether your X axis should, should be null or any column data and which one in case of that. And it's of course dependent on the panel that you are working with. The visual parameters has plenty of options that 
display that, that change how you display this information. So you might have color, shape, size, point features, faceting by, for example, uh, your um, your your discrete categorical variable or how to display the text. And uh, by clicking on each of these um, ticks, it will display extra options for that. So you can see that there might be plenty. Sometimes you don't need all of them. So in the many in many cases, the ones that are selected are just the color ones. But as soon as you increase, as, as you select more, then these options will show up. Let me just go back to the main vignette. And then the selection parameter. The selection parameters is basically the ones that are handling how you transfer the information from each panel to each other panel. And you will see a lot of this in the recipes of this workshop. So uh, interestingly, there are a couple of other controls. I can show them probably better like here. And if you're running the app, so you will have this um, organization controls that control, for example, how you can set up your different panels or how these panels might be linked to each other. I'll just show you in brief how it looks like. So there is a modal dialogue where you can just start removing around your uh, your panels and then you click on apply settings and the, the app just re-updates. Then you can also examine the panel chart. This is my favorite also because it has the magical one of generating or of meta generating the code to redo exactly all the plots that you see as an output currently in the app. So uh, if you're wondering how that works, is basically you can you can check out the source code, but in the end the magic is that we generate the code for doing that and then basically we evaluate it in the in the single panel. And if you do so, it just gives you basically pretty much a full detail of every operation that you need to do to just do the same plots one to one. We will see more probably on this in the recipe. This is my favorite one because it, uh, so it's so beautiful to have an accessible graphical user interface, but how cool is that if you also add on top reproducibility? So then of course it might take a while, for example, if you set up the panel settings like this, like in the way that you want, and you will see more on this just later on. And so you can just, for example, copy this initial simple list. I say simple because you don't have to type anything of that ideally, but it contains all the information to reproduce the exact same configuration of your package, uh, of your of your app, sorry. Then you have the documentation sub menu. You can take a tour or open up the vignette. The vignette is simple. The tour, I can show you in brief how it could look like on a different data set. And that would be, let me just get there, sorry, here. For example, this is not the same data set. It works perfectly with the Allen data sets, which is the one which is loaded when you load the example. But imagine that a tour is basically a walk through your configuration of the app and your data set. So it basically anchors this text like help uh, elements to the different uh, to the different um, elements of the UI. So and it suggests you what you can do to actually interact at best with the, with, the, with the app. So if the action tells you to please click on the header, you should please do that so, so that basically the anchor is then placed in the right position. Okay, uh, and then let me just go back, sorry, back here. We have this additional control, so we went through most of them. The last but not the least, then we have the information, so you can also use this, you can retrieve the session info if you want. This is useful, for example, if you want to report a bug. And you can also find some information on IC. Um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it, at least from this side. So uh, one more rule or one more piece of information for today is that, as I said, we had a pretty much monolithic uh, uh, workshop, which works fine, at least in our hands. But if, of course, we wanted to enhance a little more the participation and to enhance it even more, we thought about one more thing. So there is a kind of a contest that is going on, which is uh, symbolized by this hashtag I cook with IC because it's this uh, I see the re recipe or this cookbook. So 
basically we want a few just a few rules you will be doing the exercises and if you want you can tweet your screenshot of the app that you've just been doing with this hashtag and you can reply to the original quotes uh, or to the original tweet that i just posted on my on my on my profile you can check that out and among the posts i will be a, i will be happy to sponsor one lucky winner that will be will win a build your own disney plot kit and that offers support to up to 50 clusters and if you still didn't find out what that was it's gonna be that so a jelly beans uh one kilo package that will basically enable to have your own analog Disney plot or Yuma plot or whatever. So up to 50 clusters. I don't, I, I cannot guarantee that it will be really discernible. So it might even work for a continuous, for a continuum differentiation process. And everyone's a winner. So each of you will also uh, receive a sticker if you want. So the holographic sticker will be available. Just, uh, you can just ping us here or on Slack and I'll be, I'll be happy to send them around. To pass the word to Kevin, which will lead into the exercises, but otherwise we can also try to see whether there are some questions or not yet. So probably one way to we, we can use the time to tell you how we would like to interact with you for the for the exercises. As you know, so the Q and A uh, will be useful, for example, for asking questions, and we will use that also as a kind of a way to control how good you are progressing with the with the recipes so as kevin will be uh, presenting them we will post the recipe number and you will uh, you we invite you to upvote that to see whether you already solved this um then you can also uh, what was that you can also use the feed for that and when we are asking questions it would be super cool if we can have some kind of reactions with this reaction um tool and let's say the happy face or the, the heart face the, the heart uh, reaction will be for a yes and then we will have the uh sad one for saying no we have a couple of okay it's the same twice i guess how do you change the color scheme in the heat map i would pass it then to the experiment color map master kevin so it just makes me realize that we haven't put a recipe for that in today's uh, thing, but we're pretty flexible, so we can play with that. But there is a, a class that's specifically implemented in IC. I've, I've been wondering how actually useful so it could be for uh, to, to spin it out in a separate package, but we manage color map. We, we allow people to essentially uh, map, uh, create color maps, which are essentially just functions and store them in an object that IC has access to and says every time you're trying to plot that specific covariate, uh, it will be plotted using the matching color scheme. Again, I, I would suggest the following. We will see how far we go with, the, with yeah. the recipe. And if we have time, we, have a, we can put up together a tiny demo on that at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's another very, very on point question from Christophe van der Rahe. Uh, will we show the voice recognition feature? I would also say we keep it for a finale. We can try that. I have to admit that I've never tested it in the orchestra app, so I'm not sure if it's going to work. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... Okay, let's do the following. Then you, you, you lead via the orchestra, and I'll try with the, with the local setup, and I'll keep it ready for the, for the finale. Uh, and, you can uh, do that, or you can try it on your side with the orchestra setup and see if it works. Uh, orchestra, orchestra, is, orchestra that, and my firewall don't like each other. Uh, so, oh, but yes, right. okay, yeah, yeah. But uh, let's let, let's say let's go from zero to hero, and basically uh, let's start from recipe one. Yeah. Kev, Can't. fire up. The, perfect. So my screen is starting to. It's shift. another question from oh, from yes. my. Yeah, have have we watched investigators and not just package developers use IC? Mm -hmm. I would say yes. I I didn't watch them use it. I just saw or I just have the experience of me giving them the the command to launch IC, or even better, to the link to to the IC server where they can just upload their data. And I don't hear them from and I don't hear too much from them until they come up with a 25 uh, Disney plots 
and different uh, violin plots split up by clusters. So I guess they can use it. Uh, I, I'm not there as a kind of a watchdog to check out how they use it or whether they use it most properly. But I did indeed give them a kind of a first uh, kind of a schooling session because it's uh, as, as beautiful and as self-explanatory this comes to us. It's probably not to everyone, so it's totally to be recommended. But about you, you, Charlotte and, and Kevin, uh, so, do you have I, any? I mean, the way I was reading the question as well is, is investigators, so anyone else than us, uh, which uh, prompted, made me think about papers, actually. Uh, there, there are a few preprints, and I think papers as well, who have uh, mentioned IC or set up an IC instance to showcase yeah. their uh, their data set. There, there was a, the, a COVID one uh, in yes. May. From the Berlin group in uh, the Max Delbruck Center, and then there was the Teals Atlas from the from Santiago Carmona's lab. Yeah, so indeed, yeah, that's true. And also Leo Collado Torres uh, with this uh, with with the, with the single cell data recently that came out. So yeah, let's. I mean, we we hope it could pick up more, of course, but. Uh, Sometimes the, the needs of a, of, a, of a PI or of an explorer could just go beyond the nice capabilities we might offer. I would say that we are pretty much on time. Yeah. If there um, are no further questions, Kevin, spin yeah. it. I mean, and even as I go through the exercises, uh, please keep sending questions and we'll pick them up as, uh, as we go. And I think we're also saying that, so we do have 11 exercises, uh, uh, sorry, recipes. And so there is a bit of an order to them, but if you want, if you scroll through them and one of them picks your attention, you can always try and uh, post it in the Q&A and upvote it so that we, we have a sense of if there's anything that's really relevant. Um, right, so the way, so we have pre-processed an object, the PBMC3K uh, from the Experiment Hub plus, uh, let's call it PBMC3K plus. So we grab the object and we pre-computed uh, a number of uh, additional items. So there is a vignette in the middle here uh, about what we did to pre-process it. Uh, we're, you can read it on your own time uh, for, just for the sake of time doing this workshop. Uh, but there is, for example, PCA, TSNA uh, calculation and extra metadata uh, on the cells. And this is the data that we'll leverage uh, during the, the recipe to, to carry out the recipes. And the way you load this object is essentially, so you load all the IC and ICU packages, and then the workshop is itself a package that provides this load demo SC function. So if I take the whole thing and I paste it in there. Well, let's just clean up a little bit. Uh, so I'll just separate the loading part right now. So, so that's just to show you how that behaves. We're not going to use those panels on the right, so I'm going to really minimize them. All right, so you could see everything loaded all nice and well. And the way so the function essentially, the load demo CE, uh, you can use it. Well, you can point it to the object or you will find it automatically for the purpose of the workshop. And yeah, so you'll see that you have a single cell experiment object with 32,000 genes and 2,600 uh, 2, cells. And then we have, uh, so the gene symbols uh, are used as uh, row names and uh, we have a bunch of, uh, a number of fields for uh, in the row metadata. So essentially gene metadata in this case. Uh, the column names are just dummy column names to, uh, because cells don't really have any name in terms of sample. And the useful part uh, cell-wise is the column metadata. So where you will have a the barcode and some extra information that we'll see as we go through the recipes. And then we've pre-computed three uh, reduced dimension results. So a PCA and a TSNA and a UMAP. And there's no alternate uh, alt text in this object. Uh, right, so this is all you need to prepare the session. So we've really cut it down to the minimum so that we can focus on the on the recipes. So the first thing uh, Federico touched on that during his presentation of the interface is uh, how to organize panels. So not 
really worrying about what each panel is showing, but more uh, in which order the pa which panels are shown and in which order they are shown, as well as a few things like their their dimension. So I'm going to give you a, few, uh, a couple minutes, and we'll see if there's questions in the meantime. I think there is one. Um, so I, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to try and uh, go through the exercise. So using this PBMC 3K uh, data set, which we've called SCE in the session, try and figure out how you can create an app that contains only a, a, a reduced dimension plot panel, a row data plot panel, and a column data plot panel. So those three panels are shown here. And the width of the panel should be three units, four units, and five units. So that goes back to Shiny apps, which have a uh, each row in a, in a Shiny app is made of 12 units. Um, and so one unit is essentially a 12th of uh, the width of your screen. And under if so if you're following on the package down website, uh, those things, uh, we have a, a few hints and we have the solutions down there that we're going to go through in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so just mentioning the hints, uh, so the panels can be added, removed, and resized inside the app interactively using the organization button, which is in the top right corner. Uh, you can, but you can also, so you, you don't have to do it live. You can pre-specify the panels to be included in the app when you launch it, and that's using the initial argument inside the IC function. And then when you want to configure panels, you can remind yourself of uh, the list of slot names available for each panel, as well as their respective value using the str, uh, the structure function, so str uh, in short, uh, and passing it an instance of a panel object. So if you want to know all the slots and values for a reduced dimension plot, you can just call this uh, function here. So for the sake of example, I'm going to run it. And so this is telling me that when I create a reduced dimension plot panel, I can say which type of reduced dimension plot. So by default, it's not set. It's going to pick up the first one. And then you have all the rest of the information down there. Um, and perhaps I'll just give a hint to, to get you started here. There is an option called panel width, which by default is set to four. So if you want to do three, four, and five, you might have to play with that. But I think as a starter, I think it's say enough of a kind of a just like hole one in the mini golf park. Yeah. Uh, we can do it interactively. And I think you can just open up the hints if you feel you need those. Or if you kind of already got a little familiar with the UI, you might say avoid those. So just keep that, yeah. say, detailed summary thingy closed. And uh, yeah, I would and, say that. Yeah. We, we, we can always just take a, a tiny break, and in that tiny break, we encourage you to ask questions uh, while we give you the two to three minutes of time always to just try to do it on your own. And then if someone of you wants to kind of join the stage to present their own solution, otherwise we are happy to do it for you. There is a question uh, yeah. already. So it says, uh, wondering about the, sca uh, the scalability of the package, how many cells until it gets very slow. So I think this, this uh, it can be used for very large data sets. And there are a few ways in which this is achieved, right? So um, first of all, you, you don't actually have to lo load the data into memory. It can work with disk-based uh, assays, disk-based data, so HDF5 files, for example. So you don't need to be able to load the whole data set into memory. Uh, the part that's actually slow is the ggplot rendering, mm -hmm. which I think has gotten a bit faster uh, lately, recently. Um, but what you can do to make that faster is to actually visually downsample the points in the plot. So all the points are still there, but you will only uh, actually render a subset of them. So that will speed it up uh, a lot as well. So I think you can use it for, for I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, cells would, would work. We've used it for hundreds of thousands of cells for a uh, site of data. You don't have so many features, so the data is not so big. But I mean, the app uh, still works without getting unbearably slow. RAM is the limit, I would say, in, in some cases. If, if you want to load the data in completely. If you load the data, yeah. 
What, what about Kevin? When when you show the first interactive solution, you can also show live how to downsample the. To, I think to that's what I was thinking game. about. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. I, I, I'll definitely show that one. And uh, the PC, I think, is a nice example. Of where there's a bit of overplotting going on. So we're we're I'm, we're going to create this app that's on screen, and then we're going to take a, a second to to downsample it. So I just saw that Federico posted a, a message in the Q&A saying with uh, recipe one done. So I would encourage people who are doing it live to essentially upvote the message if they're, uh, if they're done with the, with the recipe. Uh, at which point I'll, uh, I mean, if we get a few votes in there, I'll, uh, I'll just do it interactively to show you and what we've just discussed. Um, yeah, there, there was also, I think, a, a preprint, maybe it's a paper now that was comparing mm -hmm. different interactive visualization platforms, and uh, IC was part of the of the lot and was doing pretty well, uh, even for big data set, provided that you were using HDF5. So um, that that really helps a lot. So there is a question from Felix, and I think it's related to the uh, to the recipe. So if I rearrange the panels each time, I delete and add the same type. Oh, I think it's a partial question. Do you want to get on stage, Felix? And, uh... I think it should said the number increases. So if you delete panel number one and then you make a new one, it will be panel number two. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's have a go at that. So if you remember um, Federico's example, uh, you can actually just call IC on the object. Oh, uh, hang on, I'll do so. Well, actually, I'll That's give fine. you best, best practice, I guess, uh, is I see you can store the output into an object and then you can use the shiny function called run app uh, on oops, on that object which then allows you to control uh, there we go I want to launch it in my browser rather than as a separate window so it's going to show up here it's a small difference but it can actually help you in uh, in some cases uh, I am going to just slightly reduce it so I can have a look at what I'm trying to achieve again. There is a question related to that. So the advantage of storing the output in an object. Yeah, so that that's exactly what I was doing here. So if you store it in an object, then you can use the shiny run up function and which comes with a number of parameters you can control if you launch in a browser or sometimes if you host it on a shiny server, you can say on which, uh, on which of the ports to serve it. So you can actually serve multiple Shiny apps on different ports if you control that. And actually, you can control which port it shows up on. So you can guide people saying, oh, you're looking for the data set number one. This is on port number one, or those things. Uh, if you don't provide uh, the, the port, it's going to pick a random one, which uh, you know is unpredictable. So it's, it's not really uh, convenient for public-facing uh, servers. Uh, and the for us to generate screenshots automatically for the vignette. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you'll notice that the recipes actually each recipe is accompanied with a screenshot, which is ex the our solution or is the target of the recipe. And the way we've done that is it's automatically generated. Uh, the screenshot is automatically generated from our coding solution. Uh, all right. So before I lose, Very easy as you can have imagined. Yeah. But so there's another are... question, Felix. Uh, if yeah. I rearrange the panels each time, I delete and add the same type the number. This suggests that the panel is not completely gone. Can I restore a panel which I deleted? And uh, by restoring, the, if you mean completely with the whole set of settings, no, you cannot. No, we we used to not have that, time. but the way we've uh, re-implemented the uh, the new panel, it's actually it's it's lost. Uh, I was wondering whether to spend some time in there, but I'm not quite sure if people would actually uh, would re if you delete a panel, if you delete a few panels, will you remember what was in panel reduce dimension one, two, three, and four, or is it just easier to create a new one and set it to to what you want? So I think it yeah, it's more about being careful only deleting panels that you know you're not going to need anymore, or that it's actually faster. Uh, to drop the panel and start a new one, and to fix the current panel, if you if you see what I mean. Okay. okay. Just so have I'm, a quick. How many other people did try? Did finish the? Uh, give me some kind of flurries of thumbs up if. Uh, oh, Lei Wang oh. actually uh, oh. said 
she add, she sent a second message. She didn't upvote your message. She posted a second one saying that her recipe is done. Yeah, I'm counting plus one on on the on that. So yeah, okay, so, uh, cool. it's two or three people anyway. So I'll I'll just do it uh, interactively. So with the yeah. organized sorry, if you go at the at the top here, uh, organized panels, and then I want my reduced plots, the raw data plot, and the column data plot. So I'm gonna drop all the rest. Uh, okay. So this, this, and that. So you remove the raw data plot. Or was it supposed to be a raw data plot? Reduce dimension, raw data plot, and column data plots. But the... you have a raw data table. Oh, oh, my bad. But, uh, so you can okay. try to add it as well. So, and yeah, if you want to add one, essentially, so I, I did a mistake. So you click in that box and raw data plot. And then I want it in the second position. So that's just a simple drag and drop. And I've obviously messed up something. So let's just try again. All right, there we go. So we drop the table with the raw data plot and the column data plot. So I'm going to drop this one. There we go. And so if you do those three, I can see from the colors it's blue, yellow, and red. So blue, yellow, and red. So that's uh, handy for me. And then the width is up here. So I'm going to reduce this to three. This one stays at four, and this one goes to five. And so one thing I wanted to, uh, to highlight is that you can see that the app in the background doesn't update uh, while I'm doing all those changes, because that would be really annoying if, every t if I want to change many panels and every time I click, something updates. So what it does is it caches the information and only applies them when I click on this Apply setting at the top. So don't forget that, because if you close the model without picking the apply, it's not going to do it. OK, cool. so that's there. And I haven't forgotten that we mentioned uh, about the visual downsampling. So this is in the visual parameter. You will see that there's those options. And I know that it's a point option. Uh, and this is where you can say downsample the points for speed. So I'm going to try to have everything on screen. So you'll see that when I tick the box, OK, so yeah, it hasn't changed much, probably because the resolution is, uh, I'll explain the resolution in a second. So if, ah, I need to be a bit faster. Right. So you can see now the resolution is 200. And if I reduce it to 100, you'll see that now it got a bit clearer up there. So the resolution is essentially, uh, if, if you say the resolution is 100, it's essentially splitting the x-axis in 100 bins and the y-axis in 100 bins. And for each square bin in this grid, it's going to display at most one point per uh, uh, tile in the grid. So it will simply visually hide any overplotted point in that part of the of the plot. But if I uh, will come back to selecting later, but if I select those points, it will essentially select also the points that are visually downsampled. They are not downsampled for the as far as the data is concerned but uh, only visually so that ggplot has less work to do. OK, shall I give the programmatical solution to uh, move things ahead? Yeah. Right? I, so don't, I don't know if we make it to have the programmatic solution for all this, if we go into detail. But it's super to have questions. So let's, let's try to yeah. keep it going and see how that runs. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to close the app. Uh, so R freaked out a little bit, but uh, yeah, the programmatic solution. So you can see that it's actually a little bit of work. Uh, if the interactive solution is described here, I'm not going to go through it again. But there's quite a few steps, as you saw, that I've done interactively to reach that solution in the screenshot. You can reach the exact same uh, solution by use, launching the app. Instead of calling IC of SCE alone, you can say, I want IC to start with an initial set of panel, which is my reduced dimension plot with a panel width of three, uh, my a raw data plot with a panel width of four, and a column data plot with a width of five. And if you do that uh, here, obviously, it's going to store it in the app. So I'm going to borrow my older command, which is running app with this new value. And if I run, oh, sorry, if I run it now, what you'll see is instead of having this app that opens with all the eight panels and in the default order, I have an app that opens with only the three panels, the three that I want, with the relative width that I want, uh, and, and that's it. And so you've reached the same thing by, uh, by simply running this command uh, with a few options. 
And that is really convenient if uh, you want to launch an app multiple times and every time you launch it, you want it to start at, in a certain configuration it will save you that uh, you have one option, which is open the default app and every time put it back in the, play, uh, in the configuration that you want. Or you have this code, you save it as a script, and every time you want to launch the app, you just run that script. So th those couple of lines. One thing that probably you can even highlight just by with the mouse is that this initial is nothing but a list. So if you define your okay. initial, uh, your, your preferred initial set anywhere, you can always use this initial equal to my initial anywhere, and that would be basically pretty much picking up your favorite, your favorite uh, setup anytime. So if I save it like this, uh, initial is this kind of, well, it's not really the prettiest object to look at. So let's see if I can just summarize it like that. So it's a list and of three uh, objects, and each object is essentially uh, a panel and with the options as we set them. So this one, the last one, for example, will have a panel width of five because that's what we told it it should have. And then uh, instead of saying, instead of doing it like that, uh, of specify the list at runtime, I can say initial equal my, uh, the initial object that I just created. And that's going to do the same thing. And that's going to run it for the, for the sake of time. But you can store your configuration as a, as an object. All right. OK. Uh, so, Great. Shall uh, we move on to recipe two? Exactly. So I'll let you look if there's any question. But the second uh, is really uh, like an exciting part about IC. So it, it comes back to this fact that you can pre-configure an app uh, to open in a certain state. So let's try and configure the data parameters. So now that we know how to organize our panels, we're going to focus on one panel and say that we want to visualize the, not the default option uh, for the column data, but we want to visualize the cell type assignment against the cluster membership. So that would be the, with the aim of identifying which is the predominant cell type in each cluster. Uh, so in this case, because both uh, variable on the two axes are categorical, the cell type and the cluster, I see will generate what's called an Hinton plot. So which is essentially a, a rectangle with a surface proportional to the number of data points at the intersection of those two levels. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna let you read the hints and try to figure out if you prefer to do it interactively or programmatically. And do we have questions? Yes, there is one from Asa, which I'm already picking up uh, as a kind of a chat like. So yes, you can. How ca can I set how many panels are in a row? Yes, say twelve is the limit because it's each row has up to twelve uh, integers to that you can use to, as a grid like object, and mm -hmm. basically the default is a four wide panel. I was just about to type it. So. Okay. I'm going to mark that and my own answers as answered. Brilliant. In the meanwhile, let's keep on, keep up with the recipe two. And if, you ha if you're if you done, the upvote is basically the best way for us to kind of keep track of how we are doing. So or I'm, the hearts. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can essentially make this a bit larger. I hope people are following on uh, are uh, following the, the, the recipes on their own screen, but if they're following on mine, I've made it. Well, no, that doesn't fit in one screen, so. That's good. There we go. If I remove the top bar. Um, I'm just going to... Yeah, so... And this okay. case, again, the screenshot gives you a hint that we're trying to look at column metadata. We okay. have a couple of people who are done with the recipe. Super. Okay, cool. So uh, what should I do, interactively or programmatically? Hmm. Uh, I think interactively is the one that covers most of the usage because yeah. if if you're not so familiar, and by the way, let me just say once again, keep keep the screenshots coming. I, I seriously have one kilo of jelly beans for you. 
Uh, all right, so up, I'm going to open this one. And just for to say myself, I'm, I'm just lazy like that. I'm already going to focus on a column data plot. I'm not going to pre-configure it, but I'm going to say I want an app that starts with only a column data plot. So that's the only thing I, uh, I need to worry about. And then I'm going to go back in my history and launch that in the browser. So I will have now a column data plot that's uh, a width of four. Although, uh, let's have a bit of fun. So that's a width of four, right? And now I'm, go I'm just going to close it. I'm saying, you know what? I want a panel with, now that I know how to um, control, uh, I know how to control the width of individual panel, as we've just seen before. So panel width equal 12. And so now what IC is going to know is it, it has to use, the panel has to use the full width of the screen. So it looks a bit ugly initially, but we know that we're going to split this x-axis in uh, clusters. So the way you do that, so what we want to change is actually the data that's mapped to each axis. So that's guiding you to the data parameters. And so the first thing that's open is what's on the y-axis. All right, let's, uh, this is label fine. In this case, there's two different uh, labels, the main and the fine. So maybe all right, I'll be a bit inventive and go with the main label. So we've got fewer. The resolution is not as uh, intense, as, uh, as high as the fine labeling. And then on the x-axis, by default, it's not doing anything. So it's just putting all everything on one axis. So we need to say we want another column data on the x-axis. Maybe just uh, quickly uh, explain what these boxes are. Uh, with the box, oh, the, the box is here, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, each box uh, at this point here, you have one box for the T cells, one box for the progenitor, one for the NK cell, right? And each box is essentially proportional to the number of data points that are uh, in the T cell uh, that are labeled as T cell, uh, progenitor, NK cell, and so on. Uh, I don't know if I missed anything that you had in mind, Charlotte. No, so each dot here is a, is a cell from that from that uh, uh, cell uh, cell type, and the boxes yeah are proportional to this the number of cells in that yeah. cell. Type. We might have an basically a visual representation of a table. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is why this panel because is called column because each point it represents a column in the object. We might get later into a row data plot where each point will be represent a row, in, in this case, a gene. But here, that's what the the, uh, the panel names are trying to indi be as indicative as possible of what, what they're showing. And because columns can, can be cells or samples or patients or anything, we just decided to call them columns because that is the most generic uh, term that we have to describe what's in a column. And yeah, in the x-axis, when you toggle it to column data, it will automatically uh, pick the first uh, column in the call data slot, which in this case is sample. So it's not particularly helpful because there's only one, uh, it's only coming from one sample, the PBMC 3K. And if we want, so there should be a column somewhere that's the cluster that we have pre-computed in the second vignette that you can read. And if I select it now, it's going to essentially split the x-axis by cluster. So now at the intersection, for if I take uh, here, you have the cells that are in cluster two and labeled as CD4 positive T cells. Uh, but you can see that cluster two also has some cells labeled as CD8 positive T cells or just T cells. So the cluster, I mean, you can call this cluster T cells or you can call it, you know, different ways because you know that it contains different, uh, it potentially contains different cell types. And vice versa, you can look from the other angle and say, in how many cluster are your CD8 positive T cells scattered across? So that can essentially help you identify also whether the resolution fits the biology uh, as far as you're interested. And so again, one of the power of IC is that you can really quickly switch between uh, values on the axis. So I'm gonna generate, uh, pick the labels fine, which is what we have in the, in the exercise in the recipe and that's where you can essentially see that you're you have a much higher resolution of the the labels here uh yeah 
OK, so I'm taking my time. We're, pro we're definitely not going to go through all the, the recipes today, but I think it's worth doing few thor uh, thoroughly and uh, a few recipes well than rushing through all of them. How, how many cells are in the classical monocytes cluster four then? And the hint is use your mouse, click and hold, and behold. Yeah. So. You can post the answer in the Q&A. And not the laughter. Come on. You can have fun with IC, but not. <laughs> They're going to be fighting for yes. the, late, uh, the candies. We should keep a tally, essentially. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. So, do we have an answer? So, how many cells do you have in there? You don't need to count them by hand. Yeah. No. Okay. That's true. I, I didn't. That, that might be possible. So, if you just select with that. Yeah. So, so if you select around that, you can go ahead, Kev. Cool. It just tells you how many cells you have over there. So you, in case you might be wondering how many cells you concretely have in each of these, you can use that subset to actually select and or to just read out some information by simply clicking on the plot. And this is done by the nice uh, shiny mechanism of brushing. Yeah, and it, it can actually help you because for a moment I thought, oh, there, there must be like three or four cells in there. And actually when I selected, it drove me crazy because it said one. I was like, that's not one dot. But the nice thing is if you double click on your selection, it actually zooms into that area. And I can see that what I thought were three dots were actually the dot plus the kind of the square around it. So there is actually only one dot in there. So I see is right. I see one Kevin zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. Kevin is still good, right? <laughs> okay. So, and then if you want okay. to the programmatical solution, again, it's uh, actually frustrating how short the programmatical solution is when you compare that to the amount of clicking that you need to do around the interface uh, to get to that result. So, Similarly to what I've done, you can you say, oh, I want my initial panels to be a column data plot with a panel width of 12. So I got that part right. But then uh, if you also add the argument x axis contains the column data, sorry, uh, that which is the cluster x axis column data, and the y axis is labels fine, and you run that app, it will essentially get you there directly. So that's a shortcut uh, saving you. Uh, a few clicks. There's an excellent question coming from Asa. Can you then subsample a data set after choosing it from the yes, app? Yes, we can. Um, so I'm just looking. Do we have the, we have a selection uh, recipe, right? Uh, so we might skip to that one. Let me see what the next one is. Uh, parameters configuration, multiple reduced dimension representation. Me how about we just skip ahead to the selection uh, to, to answer the, the question? I think at this point, we've given, the first two recipes have given you the basics. Uh, and the rest. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. All right. Go, go. So, it's recipe eight, yes. eight uh, selection configuration. So, I mean, your question is essentially how uh, can you do it interactively, which you can. This uh, recipe also takes it one step further, saying that you can program your selection in advance. So you can open the app with already a predefined selection. But we're, we're going to take it one step at a time and do it in the app initially. I suspect that the question also is, can you then export the selection? Uh, right. So that your data set is, I, 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 I mean, that's another thing. Yeah. right? So can you get the data set in your session, which is just a subset? Uh, how would you describe, I mean, the data set? Because you're not going to subset the CSI experiment object, right? You're... Yeah, so you have to kind of export the code to do the selection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you get the selected cells, and then you can subset your data set. Yeah, we might. Yeah. Maybe, you know what, probably, if you, if you display this example, say, without having uh, the, the, the attendees to yeah. do it themselves, I think it's more useful yeah. because you can kind of guide through the... Uh, Nuts and bolts. So yeah, I'll just introduce essentially what we intended for the recipe, but then I'll just skip ahead and, and show it live. Uh, so using the, the data set, uh, we're going to display the expression of the uh, a gene called CD3D. 
uh, across the assigned clusters. So you can see on the y-axis the gene, on the x-axis the clusters, uh, as well as a TSNI on the right that's colored by the cluster label. And we're going to select cells that express the gene. Uh, and we'll, we're going to highlight those cells in the TSNI next to it. And then uh, I think as a, as a bonus, we'll see if uh, how to export that into your, uh, your session. So I think you can start to have, uh, you start having a feeling of how to do that interactively, which would be essentially uh, subsetting the panels uh, the, in the app to the two that you want, and then setting the Y and X axis and everything. So I'm just going to skip ahead and uh, run this programmatical solution. You can see it's getting busy because we're defining the, the brush as well. Uh, so if I run that, and it's, it's, it's instant, right? Because all it does is it creates an app that's pre-configured, but it doesn't actually run much behind. And the magic happens when you run the app in your, uh, in your browser. I will say that also launching app like this saves you a ton of time because you only the app only bothers initializing the panels that you care about instead of initializing eight panels and then you having to cut down because this, the initialization of all the panels, especially the heat map, can sometimes take some time. All right, so here we have a selection and you might see, I don't know how it comes across through, the, through my screen sharing, but there are some dots that are essentially shown in full color and some which are transparent. So if I remove the selection, you will see that uh, all the dots will become uh, full color. So this transparency effect will have disappeared. And yeah, so the, the way you do that, uh, which way do I go about it? So right now, what we've done is we've initialized the application already where this selection parameter uh, the, the receiving panel is saying, I want to receive a selection from this other panel, feature assay plot. And if I scroll up, you'll see that this is a feature assay plot. So if I remove that temporarily and I do a selection, nothing is going to happen on the right side. But if I, if I leave the selection now and I toggle this, then you can see this panel says, hang on, there is a selection in that other panel, and I'm going to show you so here it's, it's a different highlighting because I've only selected the CD3 positive uh, cells in cluster six, five, six, and seven. But if I regenerate the entire selection across all clusters, there you go, and you have essentially all those cells. So this is obviously a clustering of T cells, CD4 and CD8 on the on the right side. So the two key things are the drag and drop uh, on the sending panel uh, to draw the selection. And then you need to remember to go to the receiving panel on the right and say that you want the selection to apply over here. And this is shown then in the bottom of the two panel that it's transmitting and that it's yeah. receiving. So the, this panel says now it confirms that it's receiving selection. It's saying you from where. And this panel is saying it's transmitting. Uh, so even though the panel on the left hasn't said anything, it, it's only the, the receiving panel that declares the relation between the, the panels. But so if I, if I remove it, you'll see that it will also disappear on the left side. So it sends information to the upstream panel saying, you need to save the selection so that I can use it downstream. And because you've drawn a selection, the sending panel also tells you how many cells you selected. So now, can you show maybe the, from, the, from the panels organization yeah. how these two plots are get then yeah. linked? So this, I mean, it's a trivial example. This, uh, this icon on the left, uh, yeah, it's the only recipe where we can really show that. Uh, you have this button here that says, so you've got the organized panels that we've talked about before, and you've got this examine panel chart. So this is uh, Federico scratches head a lot, I think, to get that working. Uh, where it's hidden behind the, the text here, but uh, you can see there's an, it's actually an arrow. So the head is not here, so therefore it's there. It ha everything is an arrow in there. So if you don't see a point in one direction, it means it's at the other end. And it's telling you that the feature assay plots, so this panel on the left, is sending its selection to the reduced dimension plot. Uh, so that is handy if you have multiple uh, fact, uh, fax gating style uh, relation between your panels, uh, you can actually have an overview of who, which panel is sending to which one. Uh, yeah, so that's that. And I think to properly answer the question uh, about exporting this, so 
if you go into extracting the R code, then it will show you, uh, so sorry, it's like reaching out of screen. That's uh, quite typical. Um, so you have this setup code at the start. So it take your object in the session, in the R session is called SCE and uh, IC refers to it as SE. Uh, so to have the, the rest of the code running, you do need to run uh, to, to, yeah, to run those lines of code to save them. And I th the key part here would be uh, the active selection. So this is the um, this is defining the brush. So the brush is drawn from 0 0.8 to uh, 14 on the x-axis and from 0 0.6 on the y-axis to, uh, sorry, it's going out of screen to the right, to 5. So 0 0.6 to 5, and you can see that it's, uh, it's exactly what we're seeing there. Um, I'm just looking, this would be, so the reduced dimension plot, where is the information that I need to show? There we go. So I think in, in the selected, yeah. 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 So the first panel essentially is drawing a selection and doing the, uh, well, in selecting the point, saving them in this, uh, so it's defining the brush, the first panel. And what this line 72 here does is it's using the brush from the first panel and selecting the data points in the second panel uh, that needs to be highlighted. So if I copy the entire code, so uh, I have selected everything and I'm copying it. And you will need to close the app because otherwise your terminal is going to be busy. And for the sake of readability, I'm going to paste it all in uh, this. So now I've got my setup code here. I'm going to run it. You probably need to load ggplot2. I might have to. It's, it's a bit odd the way it formatted it, but um, yeah. OK, so okay. I can run the whole thing, but yeah, I'm just going to source the whole. Ah, that's what I was worried about. I don't know why it looks so funny mm -hmm. on the. Oh, I think I know. I have. Uh... Okay, never mind. But so there, there is a way to have this selection kind of program programmatically available. Yeah. So if you do so, then uh, you can just use it. Now that that's me. I think I accidentally uh, added a character in the um, Ace editor before. So there we go. Uh, now. Oops. Yeah, there was a, or, or removed a comma, I think. But yeah, it's, it's fine. It's sourced it. So if I source with echo, you're going to see that it's doing everything, blah, blah, blah. And so the, okay. yeah, that was just me messing with the interactive app. And now this variable called selected contains the list of cells that essentially you've selected in the first panel. Uh, and you can essentially, uh, if I say SC subset, uh, SCE, oh, uh, all right. Selected. Yeah. So, sorry. I'm, I don't know what's, oh, there we go. Selected. In the, uh, columns. In the columns. Yeah. It's going to tell me that SC subset is 1,364 cells as opposed to the 2,643 cells, which I think we probably see from the screenshot. So we selected 1,364 cells, and that's what we've selected here. Oof, that was a long way around. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that, that OK, to, to answer the question in an in a, in a interactive way, so in a, in a vocal way, it's a, tri it's a tricky thing to do. But yes, you could do. It's uh, probably best that you can probably somehow uh, kind of take notes on how these selections are generated and then generate subset uh, objects and then probably relaunch IC on, on that subset of subset object. Shall we probably yeah. just revert to the to the simple recipe? Okay, so are, are you with us? Because we, we cannot see you just not even in the desperate mode or not the gentle nodding mode. <laughs> so every reaction from your side is a uh, super oh <laughs> You're melting. There are five, five people have done recipe eight at least. Perfect. Okay. 
So there Shall we do then uh, one, one very nice uh, comparison of Disney and UMAP? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in this case, what we're talking about is using the data set to display both a Disney and a UMAP next to each other. So in this case, so the difference with uh, what we've done before is that here you have two panels of the same class. So that's a little bit of a novelty. And what's so it's yeah two panels of the same type, but differing by the data that they're showing. So I'm kind of hinting toward what you want to, to change. Uh, so if you do it interactively, you, you're going to want to change the data. And if you want to do it programmatically, what you probably want to change is the type of reduced dimension. Uh, what, uh, no, Federico, I saw your lips move, but no sound, but you're still not muted. I'm just saying, wow, because of two, two already, two thumbs up. So um, I think it's, it's, you're picking up so super cool. Yeah. Just keep, keep going. I'm, I'm just talking to my screen. Yeah. <laughs> we have time to take a screenshot and get yes. some jelly beans. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. I already ordered the, this these jelly beans, and uh, they'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna check the status on that. I think oh. in the next one, I'm gonna enable. The, I mean, for the solution of this one to keep things interesting, I think I'm gonna enable the bugs. We have a serious competitor here. Ay ay ay! Excellent. So, well, we've got three people doing it, so... And yeah. by the way, we don't check it, but please don't take a screenshot of the vignette. <laughs> that doesn't count. Just in case someone has that idea. Well, we've got a few doing that, and I think the, the answer, again, here, that. it's relatively simple. I mean, we're back to recipe three, so we are definitely downgraded the uh, difficulty compared to recipe eight. And that <laughs> would, <laughs> I think we took quite a leap going to recipe eight after straight after two. And the way you do it is your initial set of panel is a list that calls twice the reduced dimension plot uh, function or constructor. In both cases, so we're overwriting the panel width to six because we only want to show two panels so we can uh, we maximize their size to fill the, the 12 units. And then we know from the SC object that one reduced dimension is TSNA all uppercase and the other one is UMAP all uppercase. So if you run that, uh, you will have uh, Let's see, an app, and just to keep things interesting, I promised I was going to enable the bugs. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> this is the only way that IC can have bugs. Uh, launch browser equal true. So please do not use uh, mosquito spray on your screens or anything that might damage the warranty or invalidate the warranty. And yes, they're there. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Oh, it moved. Oh, I think I killed it. Sorry. Uh, right. So, oh, yeah, you can't select the bugs. Otherwise, you kill. Oh, no, I can. There is a, there's a flag. Yeah, but if you scroll over them, you, you kill them. They're quite sensitive. OK, so you... that is essentially all we needed to do, right? I mean, the, with the bugs feature here. And you can you can also control the number of bugs and spiders that you have. Uh, I, so you can say, if you're, if you're a bigger fan of spiders than bugs, you can actually say that you want 10 spiders and only one bug, uh, <laughs> rather than, you know, it, it depends how much it, it depends how much you want yeah. to feed it, your spiders, I guess. It's Christmas, so oh, spiders. Uh, oh no, sorry, it's bugs and then spiders. Uh, I was a bit picky for for a golden uh, for a golden egg uh, for. A... Meanwhile, Kev, Disney or UMAP? Uh, yeah. What's your take? There we go. Disney or UMAP? There's a, there's a few more spiders here than bugs, so they're gonna have to. Wow. So I don't know. I'm just feeling the time while people answer, but I guess well, Disney or UMAP? You could have said a yes, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sometimes I think that they've, well, now it's biased because I killed more on the Disney side than the UMAP. Uh, I don't know what they prefer. Okay, cool. So this is how I think that you, you do. I mean, the important part here is not so much the bugs as the reduced dimension plot, Disney, and UMAP. Yeah. So maybe it's good to show one visual parameter Absolutely. example yeah. in the yeah. in the last few minutes. So we talked a lot about the data parameters. How you show what, how you select what to show in the different panels. Yeah, so recipe. We're going to skip over recipe four, which again is focused on the data parameters. 
so the visual parameters would control, for instance, uh, what you want to color by in this case. Uh, and here, so in one case, for example, you can take some column data. So you can color by cluster as well as by uh, log 10 total counts, so log 10 library size. Or you can essentially have multiple uh, multiple times the same reduced dimension plot and color by different genes. So if you want to see maybe the co-expression of two genes, you could do it in, in a scatter plot using a different panels, or you can do it in, uh, if you're looking for cell types, uh, you probably want to have a sense of their, uh, in the reduced dimension plot, which cell population are uh, light up for certain genes. Uh, in this case, so again, it's two reduced dimension plots. So you, for those who have done the, the previous exercise uh, with the two different reduced dimension plots, you can reuse essentially the same code. But instead of changing the, reduced di the, the type of reduced dimension, you can uh, find which is the argument that allows you to color uh, the, the TSNI. And uh, yeah, and switch that instead. Uh, I don't know how much time I want to give people. I'm aware of how much time we have left. So maybe a couple of minutes in case there's anyone else with questions uh, for those who want to essentially explore a bit how to, how to do that. And you can also do it interactively if you're more comfortable with that. But I see, oh. I see, haha, I see a couple of thumbs up, so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Quite rewarding since it's eight for, for, for European fellows and actually yeah. did yeah, lunchtime for, for, for the East Coasters. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, there's three people. So yeah, you have to dig a little bit further into the object. So if you use this str function that I showed you before, you'll see that there is a bunch of uh, arguments called color by and so the key one is to say color by feature name. So this is a bit of a magical value uh, heart that we ha uh, use in the app. But once you know it, well, once you've written the code, uh, we, we tend to reuse bits and pieces. So you just have to remember this feature name. And once you've said feature name, then the next important argument is color by feature name. And here you give the, the row name. So this is where, uh, so if your data set uses ensemble gene ID as row name, it's going to be a bit complicated to do this on the fly. So one of the nice things is the skater function, uniquify gene name, where you can essentially use, uh, rename the row names of an object with the gene symbol if it's unique, and then otherwise uniquify it as a combination of the gene symbol and gene ID. Uh, in, in this case, well, we're using two genes that are uh, unique uh, and ambiguous. So we can just refer to them by their, by their gene symbol. And if you do that, essentially, uh, it is all that you need to launch to get to, uh, to this result underneath. Uh, I don't, I'm just going to run it. Not that, uh, I'm going to replace this. No bug this time. Um, and then you have it. So you have, again, your two reduced dimension plots. But instead of having our TSNI on our UMAP, we have two TSNIs and uh, colored by this and that. And if you want to do this interactively, let's say, uh, the, the way, so the gene that you color by is a visual parameter. So it's not something that you can change in the data parameters. Uh, you would go into the visual parameters. And you can see that it's already selected color and by feature name. So that's where the, the value uh, comes from, the, the name of the option comes from. And you have here a drop down with all the genes available. So if you're a bigger fan of uh, uh, macrophage uh, monocytes, for instance, you can say CD74. And you can see that now it's lighting up uh, here and here. So based on the uh, on the panel on the right, that's more likely to be B cell cluster at the bottom, while uh, this one is exclusively sorry, exclusively 74 and not 78. So probably more monocytes macrophages. So yeah, that's where it's handy to have multiple yeah. panels. Yeah, Philip? There's a question from Lei Huang. Uh, does I see support highlighting cells in a single UMAP based on the expression of a set of cell markers? Set of cell marker. Uh, you mean different 
as a kind of a combination of more genes. Um, what, is, what is the package? I think it's from uh, GSVA or something for GeneSet uh, variance analysis, where you can summarize multiple genes in a single score. Among others, yes. But say, I see natively does not have the opportunity to kind of, uh, I don't know, to have the maximum value or the mean of, say, CD74 and CD79B. Mm. Uh, yeah, it would. The name of uh, it depends how you want to summarize, because, uh, and the question, I guess, is uh, th there's probably a few ways to approach that. So if you pre compute certain information, you might be able to, but natively, no. Uh, natively, no. Unless you write a custom yeah. panel for that. Or that. Yeah. yeah. So I was, or but yeah, I think the easiest is to just include the score in the call data. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, or you could also have some kind of in silico fax sorting of these cells that express, for example, both these markers. Maybe you can show that. Kat, I was wondering with a feature. There, you mean this one, the nine? Because I was. Oh yeah, 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 yeah perfect. Recipe nine is perfect. I was thinking since we're so close to the end, uh, because it's a bit uh, overlapping with what we've seen on the on the. Cell type, right? I was wondering about showing the yeah, tours, but the tour can come later. But okay. this one is on on, on quite spot okay. on. So yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, uh, verifying the cell type. So in this case, the the objective would be to create a scatter plot displaying the expression of two genes, so that we we only have two axes, right? And um, so if you select your two gene markers uh, carefully, you might be able to select genes that are you know positive for both, or positive for one, and negative for the other and highlight those in your cluster assignment. Maybe you don't have a cell type prediction, but in this case, if you have cluster and cell type as we had before, you could essentially say which cells in those cluster and cell type are um, expressing this gene and that gene. And so if the solution here, so it would be uh, to create one panel that's a feature assay plot and another one that's column data plots, and again, you set the the rest of the option are defining what you see on the x axis, the y axis, where the brush is, and yeah, the other one is saying already in advance, I'm receiving my selection from this other panel, and yeah, so you could essentially take that. So if I run it, uh, we, I'm gonna just play interactively to show maybe different markers and see how the plot on the right changes. But mm -hmm. it's nice to see that the cells that are uh, positive for CD79A and CD74 fall into the B cell compartment, which happens to be split over two clusters. So maybe we've overclustered our data slightly, or maybe there are two different subpopulations of B cells. I mean, the, the clustering generally looks pretty great. So there may be something going on in those two types of B cells, and maybe there's a third marker to, to split them on. So if you do a different expression between those two clusters, you could find that out. Uh, if And then the way you change the data parameters, right? You've got your y-axis and your x-axis further down. Sorry, the mouse doesn't want to scroll much. Uh, OK. We've got some nice information go, coming as uh, comments in the, in the Q&A. Uh, so what did we have before CD3? Uh, what did we? So if I put that gene, and I don't know, I'm going to say like the CD3E positive, CD74 negative, and that nicely lights up the CD4 and our T cells, and maybe not all the CD80 cells. I think it could be a little bit more, uh, so that maybe the, the CD8 are expressing a bit less. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, so again, that's selecting and double clicking, and you can see that there's a a, f a couple of clusters of CDA that express CD3A, but uh, not that many. So that is a really you know nice way that you can inspect uh, into in more detail. So I'm going to select here, and once the selection is drawn, I double click, and you can get a sense of what proportion, what fraction of cells are actually in that selection in the left panel. Uh, and conversely, all right, let's. I'm just going to have a bit of fun now. I'm going to reverse the transmission. So instead of sending from one to the other, I'm going to send from uh, the, the panel on the right to the panel on the left. So I'm going to remove the selection here. 
that's just an echo. Forget about this selection is not active. Uh, I'm going to select the monocytes in um, cluster four. And I can see that most of the monocytes have CD74 positive and negative for CD3E. So that's the. Probably mark it in red. Uh, can you mark it yeah. in red? It's good. Uh, yeah, good test, good questions. Uh, so. When you receive a selection, what you can say is the selection effect by default is using a transparency effect. So the unselected point uh, have a point a 10% opacity or 90% transparency. Instead, you can say, I want to color those uh, this incoming selection. So this is what was happening on the right. And now I've set it on the left. So I'm going to close that to avoid confusion. And so you can see that they're colored in red. If red is not your favorite color, you can color them in green. Uh, so yeah, that really depends on the on the background. So the green is a bit flashier; it's harder to see up here. But it's definitely it's clear that uh, your monocyte in cluster four are CD seventy four positive, and definitely uh, CD three E negative. Uh, they're they're not on the other axis. You have a few that are have a bit of expression of CD three E. Okay, so you see it really works both ways, and there's there's very little work to just switch things around. Okay, thank you very <laughs> okay. much, and. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.